So, oh, we're starting. Yeah, we're starting. And everything has to be full sentences and say the full <laughs> words and the full, okay? Let's just get the ground rules. Um, I just saw your movie. I've seen many of your movies, but I just saw your most recent movie. And I would like to know full not only why you, no, I just want to ask <laughs> Wait, why you did you, you, You've screwed up already, right? I <laughs> did, right? Oh, I saw your movie, <laughs> A Private War. Shit. Um, <laughs> Start again. I I, I'm glad you. <laughs> perfect. All usable. Um, no, I genuinely want to know, in a private war, yeah. how did this movie come to you? Was it something that you always wanted to do, to play a war journalist or some sort of character with that level of intensity and toughness in her life? I think I'm very drawn to people who show tremendous courage, probably because it's a quality I feel I lack. Um, <laughs> and I think often we are drawn to people who display the qualities that we don't have. Right. You know, if acting is the sort of ultimate escape from yourself. Um, but I think this film really interested me because because of Matthew Heinemann going to direct it. You know, so I think telling a story about a woman as interesting as Marie is only really interesting if the right. filmmaker is going to be committed to kind of a certain level of detail and truthfulness and an approach that's going to kind of unflinchingly yeah. look at every part of her. And Matthew's a documentary filmmaker before this. You could feel that in the movie, that, that it feels yeah. there's documentary elements to the whole movie, which is amazing. And I think when you're trying to convey somebody's life, um, you know, who's been lost very recently mm -hmm. and who people love very fiercely and protectively, you know, you, you want to feel that you're going to get at something that does feel truthful. Right. And I think Matt, you know, that was his big anxiety about, you know, making the transition to narrative is could he get, you know, could he embrace the same qualities that he embraced in his documentary, right. which is, you know, the ability to keep a camera rolling past a kind of moment where something has perhaps ended and, and find, a, you know, more stuff and, and stuff that feels real. How was and, that, by the way, trying to get to know her through the people who knew her? Because as an actor, the one thing that blocks you is when you feel bad about doing something. And so if people are like, yeah. I don't want to talk to you about this, was it difficult? Well, there was actually, there was one, I mean, there were a couple of moments where I thought I've got to give up, actually. You know, there was... I think it was, I realized so quickly how painful it was to the people who knew her. So you're having a conversation and one, one of her friends said, you know, you have to understand I will never like anything that's made about Marie. And wow. that is kind of crushing. And I thought, God, I have to, I don't know if I can do this unless mm. I've got this support. And then one day I was, I rang Matt at kind of middle of the night and I said, I don't know if we can do this. And, and the next morning this taxi arrived at my door in London and there was nobody in it, it just had this bag. And it was one of her friends had sent me a sweater and a jacket. What? that had belonged to Marie, and, and, and it just, it was kind of the message was keep going. That's amazing. Um, and I wear that sweater in the film when we're, and there's a, there's a scene in a boat where her, her, one of her mm -hmm. close friends is trying to get her to go in for treatment for mm -hmm. PTSD. Um, so it, it's, but also there was just, I fell in love with her really. You know, you start watching right. the footage of somebody like Marie, and she's so kind of incandescent, but in a, in just a way you admire, you know, it's her words, it's the force of her, it's the, the nothing is appealing to be liked. Mm -hmm. She's not asking you to, but, but she just has this magnetism. And I, and I thought, well, the only interesting way of doing this film is if I can kind of put that on right. screen and be She her. doesn't seem like someone who would want a movie about her, do you think? <laughs> but now <laughs> no, she'd love it. I mean, as a, as a journalist, I think she, she was really someone who doesn't want to be at the center of the story. Right. That's always the problem. And, and right. you know, obviously when, these Marie and her photographer Paul Conroy went into Syria, into Homs, and you know Marie was tragically killed, and Paul was you know grievously wounded, mm -hmm. but survived. You know suddenly they became the story, which mm -hmm. is completely not what they were trying right. to do, which right, is right. they wanted to shed light on the plight of the Syrians. Um, but I think that's one thing that I, I mean to credit Matthew, where credit's due, he had all, all the background players of our movie were refugees. Wow! From the different conflict zones we wow. were covering living in Jordan where we filmed. Wow. So Marie would definitely be be proud of that, that the Syrians right. in our final sequences get to tell their stories in their own words. Right. And, and that, you know. Um, Personally for me, some of the moments in the movie that made her the most heroic for me is when you showed her emotion, that, that her witnessing the mass grave and things like that, there wasn't this steeliness, this Hollywood thing of, you know, I'm a steely journalist. It was like, no, this is horrifying and I'm experiencing it. I don't want to experience it, but I have to. I thought that was actually what made her so heroic in the movie. I think she was someone, you know, there's a myth all the time about the war correspondent being this, you know, fearless is the word mm -hmm. that everyone uses. She was not fearless. Mm. She had tremendous fear and the real courage is having the, 
you know, is going there anyway when you're right. experiencing deep fear. But, you know, I, I learned because, because Matt was constantly putting us into these situations where the people who are forming the fabric of our movie were reliving experiences for real. So mm. in that mass grave sequence, you know, that's one day. We don't get to do it twice. There's a, there's a set wow. basically being built and dressed by the art department with corpses and remains and, and we have an excavator come and start digging up. And there are many Iraqi women currently living in Jordan who are, you know, surrounding the graveside. And uh, early on in the day, they were all sort of clamoring about who's going to get paid more and I'm nearer the front and I should get more money. And then suddenly the, the digger started doing its work and remains started coming out. And you could just see these women starting to relive something so wow. deeply painful and real. And the scene took on its own momentum. And, and I mean, I, you know, there is no way, as you say, that a war correspondent who sees these things, it's not your grief to feel. Mm. You know it's not your pain. And yet, boy, do you feel it. Right. So where the hell does right, it go right, right, is, right. is always the question. And I think, you know, that's what we talk about London. So you, you can imagine if you're looking at a script like this and you do all the war zones and then you go back to London, you Crazy. think, well, maybe the kind of tough stuff is over. But actually it's not because it's the private loneliness of being alone right. with what you've seen that kind right. of is the real cost of the job, I think. Um, and having worked with one of the greatest honors of my career is being able to get more involved with the military and, and that idea of coming home has always fascinated me. This idea of how do you come home when you've seen those things and experienced those things. And I felt that with your yeah. character was how would you ever, the, the scene I'm thinking of is when you wake up in the morning and you're looking out at the river and you shut the door. And it's very difficult to look at a serene, beautiful London skyline after you know what's going on. It's almost like there's a unlocking that you can't put back in a box once you've been there. That's very true, but I think that's not in our movie. That's no, the yeah, the which scene? when you right after you wake up in Stanley. Oh, I only know because it was my yes, brother-in-law. Of course, <laughs> but yes, after you, like, you shut the door. Well, because I, I know her movie better than she does. <laughs> yes. Literally, my mind went to a piece because there's a piece of documentary footage that I watched of Marie. Oh, really? And suddenly I had a panic that you'd seen the documentary. No. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, <laughs> so there is, a, there is a piece of footage of her because she lived by the river and always the kind of calling to the water was there. Absolutely, the scene after oh, we were with God. Stanley. What's your name? Paul. I'm Marie. I know. So you're freelance? Always. Any good? The best. Come on. What now? So I was just shooting um, a series with an actor who was wearing an eye patch, and he kept um, asking if he could remove it in certain wide shots because it was driving him absolutely crazy. And he said he wasn't, he was off balance. He couldn't run and do certain things. And it really started to frustrate him to the point where he says frustration as an actor. And I said, no, your safety as a human being. I think you're worried about breaking a leg or something. What is it like working with an eye patch for an entire movie? People, people ask me, sort of, could you actually see through it? I was like, right. No. You know, what would be <laughs> that the would point of the that? That would kind of defeat everything. Um, you know, I think the eye patch is so core to who Marie was after she lost her eye. She had, she had her eye shot out by a rocket propelled grenade in Sri Lanka and everybody thought she would give up. And, mm -hmm. and um, she carried on and, and, and it's a serious disability. You know, you're, you are literally blindsided. You have a blind side where you cannot see and she right. took that disability and went into conflict zones. Um, I mean, it no doubt gave her a, a certain swagger. You know, mm -hmm. she was not unaware of the fact that it looked right. quite cool. Right, right, right. And the Sunday Times, the definitely, pirate, yeah. that was when they started kind of putting the image of the correspondent next to their byline. Right. Because it sort of made it feel like this oh, is the paper that goes was further. Was that the first time they started doing yeah, that for her? Yeah, wow. yeah. Because it obviously kind of, you know, it, it, it combines that image of glamour and danger, which she was always quite ambivalent about, but, you know, also embraced to a degree. Um, and, uh, and I mean, it was very helpful because she, she was such an interesting physical study, Marie. I mean, mm. of, of anybody I've observed to play, um, you know, talk about someone whose whole life reads in their body. It was so, um, she's so vivid. And I think all these strange head movements that she has are all mm. linked to, the, to not being able to see. So when you scan a room, you know, it's a completely different relationship to the room than totally. you or I would have. Right. Because, you know, if I want to see around there, there's no kind of glimpsing. You've right. got to fully turn your head. And also, you say in the movie that you lost the ability to judge distance, right? You can't uh, yeah. judge so depth. There's especially, and... especially walking <clears throat> on uneven ground, which made sense then of all that. As soon as I started practicing with the eye patch, I made sense of her whole physicality, the way she walked. Right. And, 
and also sort of lighting of cigarettes and, the, and this constant anxiety about your good eye. I think that's right. the other thing that's right, really right, key right, right. is the fear of sympathetic blindness, right. the feeling that you could, you know, that this, you, you're intensely vulnerable if you, you suddenly, one, yeah. yeah. Totally. I mean, but I think as an, as, as an actor, if you are, I think we do seek those things that are, are sort of physically or, or, or challenging or change the way you negotiate the world, mm -hmm. which you must have felt doing A Quiet Place mm -hmm. with not being able to speak and having to sign. And Absolutely, and I don't know how you felt, but there was definitely a huge feeling of fear in a good way that you were, you were scared to pull it off. You were scared, is it? Is our word something that not only you need as an actor, but you need as a director and editor to sort of meter your movie? That that's, there's an editing timing to words that if you don't have them, will you have that? And I remember thinking about that, but the, the cool thing about not being able to speak in a movie other than with sign language is you, I left the door open to allow organic moments to happen. So I had the whole day planned, but I always thought if something comes in and beats it, let's, let's do that. And what I wasn't prepared for, I knew that the scenes would be pretty interesting, but I, I wasn't prepared for them to be, in my opinion, more beautiful than anything I could have written. There was something to, I remember day three, watching Emily do a scene with these kids. And these kids, Emily was great in the scene, but these kids were so unbelievable that when you took away their ability to speak, they were emoting mm -hmm. some of the purest performances I had seen ever. And I, I was tearing up and I turned to my producer and I said, Oh my God, this might work. And I'll never forget. He said, hey man, we are way too far down the path for you to tell me this <laughs> might work. Um, but you, yeah. you, you think it's going to work, but you never know until you really see it. And, and it was beautiful. As far as my acting with no words, it was, it was kind of refreshing for me. My favorite scene for me selfishly was the scene that I'm on the path with my daughter. And I really wanted to delve into this idea of two people who are not only best friends, but they were probably carbon copies of each other before a horrible tragedy happened. <clears throat> and the father, as much as he doesn't want to and knows he shouldn't, he does blame her for the death of his son. And mm -hmm. she feels intensely like the black sheep, not only because she's deaf, but also because she created this situation. So mm -hmm. she thinks, and to have two people trying to communicate lovingly and just without that emotion behind it, without that warmth in your eye was so, bizarre and, and moving and it was so intense especially to work with her she was uh emily and i on the same night driving home <clears throat> said the same comment which was weird i said she's actually not from here i'm pretty sure she's an actual angel that there's there's something about her that is otherworldly and one day we're going to learn that we were so lucky just to spend any time with her i mean that it's like i never yeah. thought i was working with a deaf actress i thought i was working with one of the best actresses i've ever worked with in my life and an angel like there was something I just, I just prayed the cameras were on because as we were talking about sure. earlier, there's something behind her, inside her that is emanating, that is different than what, what any of us could do. But so, so did you learn sign language so that you could converse freely or, or did you, what did the script look like? Did you have... The script written was written scenes? word, yeah. And I said that, so instead of, you know, the, on the dialogue, instead of saying, you know, screaming or loudly, it said signed, you know, this is being signed. And so all the, all the dialogue was written as if we were talking, but it was always signed. We learned our, our scenes very quickly. And to be really honest, I did the best I could to learn as much ASL as I could. But what happened was as soon as the, the actress who plays my daughter is <clears throat> Millison Simmons, and she is, uh, something different. There was something different about learning ASL. And then when we finally had her on set, because I know this sounds weird, but she was so much more loving and warm how she was. There was like this understanding of the fact that you're even attempting is so sweet Her of language, you. Yeah. So I will meet you halfway in some weird alternate form. There, she can't meet us halfway and teach us sign language, but she started understanding. And what I mean by that is at South by Southwest, when we premiered the movie, I remember my mom went over to uh, Millie to, to tell her how moved she was by the performance. And Millie always has a, a uh, interpreter with her and she'll, the interpreter will stand right next to you and you just speak directly to Millie. You never look at the interpreter and the interpreter will just um, uh, be translating as you go along and Millie will look at you 
She never looks at the interpreter. Mm -hmm. She's always looking at you because she says that's where she finds the intention. She'll actually know more about what you're saying before she knows what you're saying. And so this day, my mom ran over to her and, um, and said, I, I, you know, I love the movie and was getting emotional. And you saw her interpreter running across the room to try to be there for my mom. And Millie put her hand up and said, I understand everything this woman's saying to me. And I was just like <sighs> bursting with tears. It was so intense, so beautiful. And why did you feel so that it was so important to cast someone who was really deaf? <clears throat> well, it's interesting. It was a non-negotiable thing for me. I give a lot of credit to Paramount. It was actually my first call to the studio. And I had never directed a studio movie. So it's pretty... <laughs> It's pretty gutsy to go in and say, I'm going to direct my first studio movie. I've never done visual effects. And um, uh, also, it's all sign language, and I have to cast a deaf actress, all these things that you've never done before. And they said, sure, go for it. The reason why it was non-negotiable to cast someone like Millie, to, or a deaf actress, to play a deaf actress was not only, obviously, the, the um, performance is more organic, because someone's living through it right. every single day. That's the obvious reason. The more important reason to me was I needed a guide. Uh -huh. I was writing a movie about a family who had a deaf child, and I know nothing about that. And so I needed someone to walk me through, what, is, what do you feel when you wake up in the morning to be the only person who can't hear in your family? Do you feel left out? Do you feel empowered? Do you feel bitter? Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel at school? Do you feel <clears throat> a sense of community with people? Do you feel left out? All these things. And she was just an unbelievable open book and her entire family. They let me know every little detail about her. Actually, one of my favorite stories is in the movie, um, one of my favorite things that we decided to do, again, letting organically something happen. It was never in the movie, never in the script. I asked her mom one day after Millie walked away from talking to her mom, and I said, can she hear anything? And she said, no, she can hear a low level sort of hum or a rattle, but there, you know, if you were speaking to her, she could never hear you. But if something loud crashed behind her, she'd hear a tiny bit of it, but she'd also feel it. And so when we were doing the sound design, I said to the guys, I want to attempt something. I want to actually mm. attempt exactly what her mom said. I think every yeah. time we cut to her perspective, we let's cut her. out sound, but let's not go dead silent. Let's have this presence. Yeah, and it works so well. It thank you. So and well. I had to tell her mom before South by Southwest, I said, listen, I've done this thing. I, please, if you feel anything about it, I still have a week. I can change it. And to see her mom come up to me crying as hard as she was. It'll make me tear up just thinking about it. But um, she said, I've always wanted to know what the experience was oh, of my God. daughter, and I finally have it. And I was like, good night, everybody. I'm going to go to bed for three <laughs> weeks and cry forever. It was the most moving experience, and that organically came from this, you know, family that we had created. You know, this, this trust through not only the actors, but the crew and the families, and everybody was in on this thing 100%. But I think, you know, in a film where you have to be silent, you know, that intense focus on someone's face, the need to communicate, yes. to yes. read, to pull yes. meaning from someone's mm -hmm. eyes. You know, she has that in buckets, but you and Emily d do the same. And and um, and so does Noah. And, and it's, you know, you really feel, I feel acting is so much about that it's, it has Absolutely. to be eye to eye communication yeah. and soul to soul. And, 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 and then you sort of distill it down to its purest form. And it's, it's, it's very beautiful and very, Thank very, you. very, very moving. But Thank I, you. Um, you know, I think, you know, you, maybe you are led by a, a child like Millicent. How old is she? She was 13, 14 right. when we shot. Now she's 15. All right. I mean, but also the, I think the the whole world of hearing aids, you know, that's such a beautiful detail in that film. Oh, you know, and the you. care yeah. of the care that you take, you know, trying to make these things work with right. such limited supplies. And I think at the end, when she comes in and she sees, yes. you yeah. know, and there are certain children who have the maturity to understand. Now I'll cry. The the, the act of love that's gone into exactly. something like that, and that's she exactly sees that right. in that moment after you're gone, and she sees this labor, this intense <clears throat> mm -hmm. labor of love. And so, it's and exactly it's very, what we were talking about. Thank you. It's one of those things where this is, this is what makes her special. This is what makes, I think, any actor at a caliber that's beyond technicality is how do you explain to a 14-year-old girl, you've just found out your dad is dead and he's dedicated his whole life where you thought he didn't okay. love you anymore, but actually you were the only thing he dedicated his entire life to. How do you explain that in a direction? And what we were talking about before was, it was really almost like discussing psychoanalysis with this girl and de delving into things that maybe 14 and 15 year old people shouldn't be necessarily yeah. 
being weighed down by. And as I was explaining this thing, she saw all the props, she did everything. And I could tell I slowly stopped speaking because I could tell she was ready. She knew exactly what to do. And that is her first take where she picks it up and one tear goes down. It was so powerful instead of, okay, well, we'll get it in the edit. You know, I'll build the scene as a director. No, I was so lucky that the camera was rolling. I don't know how someone, I'm personally still in awe of both Noah and Millie, that these kids could have depth and knowledge and wealth. I know having kids myself, even at a young age, they're emotional, like fireballs. There's so much emotion in there and they can't quite articulate it, which makes them more emotional. But to be able to communicate it, to be able to deliver exactly what you're feeling was... I was in awe watching those kids the I whole time. I felt it when I, I was on set of it while they were making Atonement, and I felt the same thing in Saoirse Ronan, watching her age mm-hmm. 11 play that part in Atonement. Right, exactly. That's what I felt watching Millie in your film. The other thing I think was so amazing about all the acting in your film is, is per, from a personal point of view, I find fear, I think, the hardest thing to trick my mind mm. into fully believing. Mm. I feel that I'm pretty conversant now that I can you know, trick my body into feeling love, anger, right. passion, right. doubt, I don't know, right. um, despair, for, for, uh, things that impact the body very critically. And I think fear is, the, is, for me, the hardest thing to fully escape from your surroundings right. and commit to and believe in. So mm-hmm. I just wondered how you, because I felt it so strongly that, that people especially, you know, well, all of you actually, um, but, but I... The, the fear was so palpable, yeah. and I just wondered how you worked on that. Or well, again, or... I, got, I got so lucky, but it, it was these conversations. So well, the first thing was creating a family dynamic where people would care about each other. And one of the beautiful things about being an actor who gets the wonderful opportunity to direct is you get to steal from all the other sets you've been on, and you get to decide what to do and what not to do. And I'm sure you've been there where someone says, you know, you're playing a love interest like Go to TGI Fridays, and when you come out, you'll be in love. Just, like, take this person to dinner, and now you'll know how to be in love. And I always felt that very forced. I didn't feel anything. I got to know that person. So what I decided to do on this one was invite their families over to our house. And the more time that I spent with their parents and seeing them interact with their parents, Mm -hmm. that's how I deciphered how to be their dad. And you could see it. You could feel it. And Millie said the same thing, and Noah said the same thing. Once we saw you as a dad, you were no longer a director anymore. You were a dad that we could see what the world meant to you mm-hmm. in black and white. And so we were able to relate to you in the same way. And I will say it's just one of those magic things where we really did love each other. We really did get lucky to have these kids that were not only unbelievable actors, but they were the most caring, sweet kids. The parents were unbelievable, which I know I'm sure you've seen is not always the case. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where we had deep conversations. I mean, a lot of the shots from uh, behind the scenes, you'll see Emily touching Millie's face and just talking to her about how great that last take was or how this thing was. And it was this care that sort of conjured a magic in the room that, that was able to be tapped into. Yeah, I think you see that in you and Emily's performances, that you are focused so much on them, on making their world 100% real, mm-hmm. that right. then every, everything is 100% real. Right. You know, those lovely moments when Emily's making... Um, Noah laugh, you know, when she's saying, you know, you've got to look after me when I'm old. You know, right. it's just, it's gorgeous, that, that moment. And, Thank you. And you, when, you know, when, when you see the old man be right. slaughtered by the, the beast. And, right. And, and you've taken Noah out to, um, you know, to, to train him up and have that, have that alone time. And then, you know, looking, it's again, it's the looking right into his right. eyes and holding. Right asking someone to believe in you in that moment where they are so right. scared. Well, you yeah. just tapped on the exact reason why I decided. So I've never been a genre fan. I was way too scared as a kid and just completely shut that part of my subconscious down. And so when someone asked me to be, they asked me first to be an actor in this movie oh. and it was a spec script. And I was reading the spec script and the idea was perfect. The idea of a family that had to remain quiet was there. It was beautiful. But it was much more of a horror type movie. There was something that it was missing. And what I realized was Emily, not and I, Emily had had our second child only three weeks before. And so I was holding a three week old reading a spec script that had to do with a family and what would you do for your kids? And I said, well, if I do this, I'll rewrite it and I'll rewrite the whole thing and make it about the experience that I'm having right now. How do you communicate not only to uh, an art piece, but how do you communicate to your kids how much you love them? So 
everything I did in the rewrite was connect everything back to what it feels like to be a parent, what it feels like to be able to tell your kids that. So every uh, huh. grabbing of the face, talking, it all came from, I know huh. it looks weird looking at the poster, but this was a love letter to my kids. This was the first time I felt open enough to say the things I've really wanted to say using a genre film, which was kind of insane. And using silence. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was so sort of was a perfect. that was the draw. That was yeah. what pulled you into it. It cracked me wide open. And then open. when did you say, I want to direct it? I didn't. My wife did. Okay. So I came down. I pitched her the whole thing. I'd finished the script. I'd finished the, reading the spec script. And about 30 minutes later, this has never happened to me before, the entire movie was laid out. It was like the Matrix. It just like built itself. I mean, every shot, every idea, every little thing mm -hmm. came out. And so I walked her through what I was going to do with the rewrite. And she said, you're not going to do that. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And she's holding our three-week-old baby. She said, no, you're going to direct it. And I said, oh, I don't know. I've never done a studio movie in visual effects. And she said, I've never seen you lit up like this. You have to direct it. And she, and she was right. I mean, it, it, was, yeah. it, it, it was pouring out of my, you know, uh, well, my soul all and my combusted DNA. combusted by, by the experience of having a new baby. Absolutely. Which, and as then, you know, of course, is like having terrifying. a new baby when you have to be silent with the baby. Exactly, yeah. So a question that I always am interested in is, so there are different reasons to take different parts. You're at a level where you've obviously worked with some of the best directors that, uh, that I think are some of the best directors. Is that something that is a must for you? Do you have to work with someone that you entrust? Or is a script and an idea good enough if you're not sure what this director is going to do? I don't think, you know, it's very complimentary to say that I've, I feel I haven't always made great choices, to be <laughs> fair, you know, and, and I've, but I've, it's been a learning curve. I think I am now in a position where I can make the choices that I can truly get behind mm -hmm. and I can feel now I'm living my truth through my work right. now. But well, it hasn't nice. always been like that because sometimes, you know, you have to take a job and you're hoping that something will lead to something else and usually it doesn't. Right, absolutely. <laughs> usually when no, you totally. make a decision based on those things, it, totally. it, it doesn't work like that. I remember someone um, saying to me a long time ago, you know, just work with great directors. And I went, oh, is that, oh, is that it? You just have to work with And great. I think that's probably, you know, <laughs> right. but working with the really great directors is, is obviously, because you're, you know, there's a part of you as an actor that is deeply committed to a character and part of you that also wants to serve someone's vision, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you have, I have to know now that this director, whoever he or she is, needs to make the film, doesn't just right. want to make it. There's a kind of need, rather like you were describing with right. The Quiet Place that Emily saw. Right. You know, there's something pouring out of you, burning in you, that, yeah. that this is the one. Right. You know, for Matthew Heinemann, this was the one. I knew, you know, and I wanted in on that. I wanted to share that. I wanted to be his partner and go That's on that awesome. journey with him. I wanted to say, you know, I will do my damnedest to be a Marie for you that you can watch like you're making a documentary. However, oh, that awesome. will come about and I know that talking to me right now that seems like a long shot <laughs> no, because that's amazing. I you know but um but what a, he must have gone of, home and been so excited to be well I think so he committed. kind of knew that we'd we've been re you know there's a lot of crap talked about trust I think in right. our business you know and a lot of people talk about you know you must have had so much trust and you know you sort of think yeah did I have trust in this movie I totally trusted yeah him. you know we had a relationship that had to be constantly right. you know renegotiating that trust because otherwise you don't have the courage to go and do it, really. Mm -hmm. um, so a director that you put your confidence in and you trust, and that you cannot be glib about that term. You've no, got it's to, true. And those children trusted you in a quiet place. Everybody right. obviously trusts you. Well, it's all um, high wire acting. If you don't trust that person, there's a much bigger chance of falling. And I think that yeah. that's, especially when you do a role like that. It's or you're not making like, yourself super vulnerable and you've got right. to know that that is in hands that, right. that are going to hold you. Right. I hate being in a war zone. But I also feel compelled, compelled to see it for myself. You know, one of the great joys, I think, about doing a movie like A Private War is that Marie Colvin herself was so funny. Right. I mean, thank God she was. I and mean, that was one of her great, you know, one of the things I think got her through the, the tough times is yeah. that she had an amazing sense of humor. But, you know, our set was very, very emotional. I bet. By and large. Um, particularly because we had real people who were reliving their own traumas. So, you know, sometimes I, sometimes I wish that we'd had more opportunity to explore the humour, but then I sort of look back and think, well, ultimately the film that Marie would have wanted to make mm -hmm. 
or wanted to have made would, would be the one that's focused on the plight of the people that she cared so much Absolutely, about, not yeah. on her own right. humor. But, and but yet when some of my were... favorite scenes were when you <laughs> laughed. I mean, there's that horrific, uh, yeah, I don't know if I can give any more, but, but the horrific thing when you visit all those children and then you're writing your story and you you'd make a joke with Jamie about booking the wrong travel. <laughs> I thought that was so amazing and so, I mean, what a direct dichotomy that was between two scenes and the fact that you, I, I would imagine it's almost like an impulse, like a nervous tick to have yeah. to make a joke about it. And I think at that point, Jamie and I needed to kind of let off some steam right. on set. You know, sometimes right. there are, you know, there's one, there's one point that we're sitting in this media center and I'm sitting on a on plum toilet, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the sort of temptation again to make a joke there about, right. you know, God, you know, nice hotel, but the <laughs> right. plumbing's a bit shit. Right. It? Did you, you know? ever improv? Um, we did, we did, and 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 a lot of it, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of things are things that arose in the moment. But what about what about in a quiet place? Did you? you I'm sure you did have tartar to improv humor, a sign language, but, but no, <laughs> no. But I'm sure there was some levity to cut through the fear. Was there? No, or, I think it's or, very similar to what you said. I think at the end of the day, our set was certainly not dealing with the most cheerful of avenues to walk down every single day but it's all about the people which at the end of the day our crew was phenomenal um emily's one of those so i'll tell you i guess to one way to encapsulate is emily <clears throat> is about to do the bathtub scene like this very intense scene and she'll never say this but i get to is that's one take the her whole intense sort of release of oh. what's all going on in that one moment is one take and i've been told you know Rob Marshall, who just directed her, and Mary Poppins said, um, when you work with her, you'll see. And I said, I know, I'm her biggest fan. He said, no, 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 you'll see. And I said, I know, I love her so much. And he said, nope, not until you're in the room and she does what she does will you know why your wife is such a good actress. And I thought, that is such a beautiful thing to say. So here we are, day th you know, five or six or something. And she does this scene, and she does it in one take, and the entire crew was holding their breath. It was like the air had gone out of the room. And, and I remember a crew member saying, I don't think I was supposed to see that because it was so intense. And so I call yeah. cut and I say, that's lunch. And you see Emily go from pure pain of giving birth and fear and all this stuff. And then she goes, what is for lunch? Is it fajitas? <laughs> I heard somebody said fajitas. And the ability to snap in and out, I don't think I have that magic that she has. But th that's the thing is like, you can't, we, we're two people who don't go home and live that. Like people ask Emily all the time too, uh, and is did you live with that movie? Did you live with that character? We are not the people who, there's a release as soon as you call rap that you get to go home and kind of delve back into yeah, your real yeah. life so that you can bring this heat the next day. But I've also worked with a lot of people who stay in it. And by the way, what do you do when you're doing a private war? Do you, do you stay in that turmoil or do you pop yeah, in and out? I think I can sort of go home and get on the floor and start playing with Lego. But I mean, right. my, I, I have the And that's not even with your kids, just yourself. Just by myself, <laughs> yeah. I'm working on the, um, yeah, the polar ice exploring sets. Perfect. Um, the, uh, I think my husband might say differently. I, I have this, it might be an illusion that I kind of walk through the door and, you know, the character's all gone. Right. He feels I'm not back to myself till a few months afterwards. So, you know, up for discussion. He's like, Marie, whenever say, you can bring Roz back, like, that'd be great. Just, that's yeah. amazing, yeah. So uh, I I never wanted to be, uh, I actually, I, I had done acting in college just to be a part of a group of people. Mm. Um, I didn't think I was good. I didn't think there was anything to it, but I knew these people in this circus I needed to be a part of. They were the most interesting, thrilling people. So. I graduated mid-year in college and had to make up a semester. And so I went to this theater school solely to make up classes, pure laziness. Just like if this, if this school will give credits back to my college, we're good. And I ended up totally falling in love with acting and that's when I decided to do it. And as we were driving out of that school, I said to my mom, I'm gonna move to New York and be an actor. That was not on the cards. And she immediately said, great, go do it. Just so supportive and she said, the only thing I ask of you is that in two and a half or three years, if nothing comes up, we used to fish as kids, and she said, if you haven't had a bite or a nibble, do me one favor, you have to pull yourself out of this. Because as your mother, the one thing you can't ask me to do is tell her son to give up on her dreams. Mm -hmm. I thought that was profound and yeah. really amazing. Cut to two and a half years later, I did call her, and I said, I did it, and I, I gave it a shot. You were right, I haven't had any nibbles, and I feel good about it. I was really sad, but I said, oh, I feel good about it. <laughs> and she said, oh, it's September. You know what, Just we'll talk about it at Christmas. Just finish the year. And three weeks later, I booked the office. And so oh, I was wow. on a train the next day oh, if, wow. if she had accepted it. And uh, so I owe my mom 10% of everything I do. And, <laughs> and, that's, and that's that. Or a bit more. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever wanted to give up? Or is this something that you've always wanted to do? 
Yeah, I, I, I thought if I, you know, if it wasn't going to work, I wasn't going to, you know, I needed to make a living at it. I needed to, to mm -hmm. be a, a job. I didn't want to be an actor who didn't actually get any work. And I thought I would retrain as, like, I'd go back to school totally with my tail between my legs, like, right. do, you know, do science, do something I'd never done, retrain as a doctor or something, right. you know, really pursue something differently. But then now, you know, I still come home and think, I've got to give up after this one. I mean, I do. I feel like it'll never be good enough. You know, I think right. that's a sort of a, probably a feeling that, you know, that you could never get as close to the truth as you want to get, you know, which is basically to be a totally different person. Right. Is, Was is there the a moment is, that is, you said this, so, will, this will work? Because uh, well, on a TV show that I did for 10 years, I didn't really have a choice. It was like, I mean, which was amazing, but I didn't have to worry. I wonder if this will work out. It was working out. But yes. when you do movie after movie after movie, it, it's, it's really day to day. As soon as you end a movie, you're not sure there's going to be another movie. And no. Was there a movie always. where you're like, I think this is going to work out? Oh, gosh, I don't, I don't know. I never, I don't think you ever feel like it's going to work out necessarily. Right. I really don't. Right. And also you can do, you know, you can, you know, with this one even, I mean, a bit like Marie Colvin always said, you know, will enough people care when your story reaches them? Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember standing sort of, you know, you've been on the set, you've, you've, you've had the kind of full experience and then suddenly you're left alone with yourself again and you think, well, what does it all that mean Right. if the movie doesn't work and nobody sees it? Right. And it seems like people are seeing it and people are caring, but, but you have no idea. That is not, Right. That's, you can't control that. That's and, true. And, and then what does it all mean if, if there's no audience?